Welcome, everybody, to our public policy forum on Muskrat Falls. My name is Mike Clare. I'm the Associate Director for Public Policy at Memorial University's Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development. Delighted to see so many of you here this evening. It's obviously an important issue. You could argue that it's probably the preeminent public policy issue of this decade. The plan to build a $6.2 billion dam is ambitious yet risky. It has been proposed by NALCOR, the province's publicly owned energy corporation, as the best option to supply a sustainable source of electricity to the province far into the 21st century. In addition, the project would replace an oil-burning power plant in Holyrood, it would allow us to export electricity to the mainland without going through Quebec, and it would help exercise the ghost of the Upper Churchill contract. But a funny thing happened once the project was officially unveiled. The paradigm shifted. What, what had begun as an environmental review of a slam dunk project turned into the larger question of how we provide a stable, sustainable, affordable, environmentally sensitive supply of electricity to the island. When the paradigm shifted, Muscat Falls was demoted in the public discourse from the only project under consideration to simply one of several possible alterna alternatives, ranging from wind and small hydropower on the island to liquefied natural gas, and even to waiting until 2041 when the power from the Upper Churchill contract reverts back to the province. So all of a sudden, there's no shortage of ideas about supplying energy. And that's how it should be. As a mature democracy, it is our collective responsibility to examine those major issues which affect us all and which furthermore will affect our children and grandchildren. In a modern democracy, citizens have a responsibility to understand the issues which affect them so that they may appropriately influence their elected representatives. And this is true no matter how complex the issue. And this is a complex issue. And so that's why we're gathered here tonight. Tonight, we will scrutinize the proposal submitted by NALCOR so that we may understand it to the to, to the best of our abilities and be best positioned to compare it with other possible alternatives. Before I introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, I'd like to recognize a couple of dignitaries in the room. First of all, uh, Mr. Bob Simmons, the chair of the Board of Regents. Thanks very much, Mr. Simmons, for coming. Uh, Dave Vardy is here as well. Uh, Dave, uh, our colleague at the Harris Center, has done a great deal to get the discussion. There he is in the middle of the room. Has done a great deal to help uh, uh, initiate discussion on this project. And uh, we have copies of Dave's report here. If after uh, the session, if you want a copy, please uh, see me. We'll get you a copy. I also want to recognize, and I'm, I'm sorry if I've missed anyone. I, it's this very large crowd here. Uh, other uh, dignitaries, uh, Chris Montague, president of the Nunat Tukavut uh, uh, organization, formerly the Labrador Métis Nation. Roger Grimes, former premier of the province. Ryan Cleary, MP for St. John's South. Dale Kirby, Lorraine Michaels, and Jerry Rogers, uh, NDP uh, MHAs in this province. Welcome all. This event, uh, given its importance, is co-sponsored by two organization, organizations. The first is the Applied Economics Research Initiative of Memorial University. This is their coming out party. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Doug May to come and say a few words about this initiative. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. And it's great to see so many people here. I know Wade is encouraged by the standing room only crowd and uh, but you have to be careful uh, when you're dealing with economists because one of the things we could do is to try to limit the crowd by raising the price of admission here but we <laughs> we decided to give it away for free the other thing i was i was hoping to get our logo up here uh, one member of the audience mike michael clare said it's a fantastic logo see the harris center is up there but rob greenwood has promised me that that will be replaced by the <laughs> Applied Economics Research Initiative uh, to suite, right? Well, tonight, as Michael said, we are launching the Applied Economics Research Initiative here at Memorial University. And this initiative is, is an effort of the members of our economics department, but we hope eventually that we'll be joined by other applied economists in Atlantic Canada, indeed others who are working with us across the country and around the world. I'd like to take uh, just a, a few minutes, because I know most of us want to hear Wade. I want to take a f say a few words about the background motivation for this initiative, our mission, our vision, and some of the risks associated with this venture. Um, first of all, in the background and motivation, about a year and a half ago, Wade, Locke, and myself were concerned about the relatively few number of undergraduates and graduates that were in our discipline to carry out applied economic research. 
new members of our department, some of whom are here tonight, uh, carry, uh, were playing an active role, but the demands on their time, and indeed on other active researchers, limits the contribution that can be made. Our solution, with the help of others, was to launch this initiative. Ray Gazine has been particularly supportive, but we have also see, received tentative uh, commitments from the university administration, the federal government, the provincial government, and industry. Professor Scott Lynch is currently the coordinator for our initiative. And Scott, identify yourself. There he is, right in the front row, eager to hear Wade's words. The vision that we have is to provide professional and independent economic analysis applied to real world events and challenges that are associated not only with this province, but also with Atlantic Canada and beyond. Our mission is to facilitate our vision by mentoring and training students, by supporting faculty members and their associates with funding and with freeing up time to carry out research and by interesting students, hopefully some of them are here tonight, in carrying out research. An important part of our mission is also to inform the public of, our, of the findings in a manner which is understandable. This is often a challenge since many of our analytical models and associated methodology is highly technical. Now in carrying out our mission and trying to achieve our vision, uh, there are risks and uh, this is often associated with technical and rigorous analysis, since this has often been associated with a lack of caring about social progress and well-being. Still others tend to interpret our analysis from a political perspective. Indeed, one famous uh, economist, Karl Marx, noted in his book, Das Kapital, in fact, he, what he did was to warn our fellow economists about these political forces and if at all possible, try to avoid them. He was more or less successful, I guess. However, those who have followed the evolution of economic thought will know that the ultimate motivation of economists is to make the lives of others better than might otherwise be the case. Now, I understand, I believe that Dr. Locke's, that is Wade's presentation, is the embodiment of our vision. We hope that his efforts are the first steps of a long and successful engagement of our initiative here at Memorial University. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. It's a wonderful initiative, and we wish you all the best with it. As NALCOR has proposed it, the Muskrat Falls project would provide surplus electricity to the Maritimes. This makes the project of great interest to our, to our sister provinces and to the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council. APEC is a nonprofit think tank based in Halifax, which monitors the health of the region's economy, and I'm pleased that they are partnering with us to bring this event to you. Elizabeth Beale, President and CEO of APEC, and also a long-standing uh, member of the Harris Centre's Advisory Board, helped promote this event throughout Atlantic Canada, and we're, we're greatly appreciative of that. Unfortunately, Elizabeth, at the last minute, uh, couldn't make it, uh, but uh, she brings her greetings, and I'll just say hello to Elizabeth. Uh, I'll just take a second to outline the, uh, the session this evening. Our presenter will speak for about an hour, and the rest of the time uh, we'll spend a, a, a Q&A a Q &A with you, the audience. For those of you who are in the room with me, we are going to circulate a couple of wireless microphones, so if you want to ask a question or make a comment, raise your hand, we'll get the microphone over to you. You will have a maximum of two minutes to make your, uh, make your question, ask your question or make your comment. We know there's lots of questions out there, so uh, we're going to impose this discipline upon you, and we have this little timer that's going to beep when your two minutes is over, and you have to stop talking. Um, and also, you don't want to incur the wrath of Rob Greenwood. It's not a good thing. Uh, for those of you who are watching on the internet, uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen an email address and a Twitter handle. You can submit a question that way, and uh, we'll try to read as many of those uh, to, so that Wade can answer them. The uh, discussion session, as I said, is going to be moderated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Greenwood, the Executive Director of the Harris Center and the Office of Engagement. We're going to adjourn at 9.30. Now, we did start a few minutes late, so I'll leave it to Rob as to whether he wants to go a little bit later or not. But afterwards, those of you who are here in the room with me or in this building, in, in the overflow rooms, are welcome downstairs to a reception where you can continue the discussion with our presenter. 
the video of this session is being recorded. Uh, we hope to have it on the Hair Center's website tomorrow or the day after. So if you want to share it with friends or others, uh, you, uh, please monitor our website. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Wade Locke. For the benefit of the few who may not know him, allow me to trace the outline of his career. Wade is a full professor of economics at Memorial University, where he specializes in the Newfoundland and Labrador economy, resource economics, public finance, public policy, innovation and productivity, economic impact assessment, and, and cost-benefit analysis. He has published extensively in a variety of public policy fields and has provided his professional ex uh, services to all three levels of government in, in Canada, to governments outside of Canada, and to local, regional, national, and international businesses. He's also tapped by media locally, nationally, and internationally to, to comment, and he is a past president of the Atlantic Canada Economics Association. Wade studied biology, of all things, at Memorial, and then obtained his master's and doctorate degree in economics at, at, at McMaster University in Hamilton. He also has a certificate in applied petroleum economics from Van Muir's Associates, a global oil and gas consulting and training company. His research has had major impact on public policy, particularly on the public finances of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and the development of its oil and gas resources. Wade has helped clarify a number of complex events at previous Harris Center public forums, which have dealt with the Atlantic Accord, equalization, oil and gas revenues, and the province's public finances. I can't think of anyone better suited to work us through the uh, Muskrat Falls proposals. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Wade Locke. Those of you who are standing, we also have an overflow room, another overflow room, just on, uh, at this level here, in that direction. So please uh, feel free, if you're tired of standing, there are chairs down there. In the Beatrice Watts boardroom, uh, 2014. How come the timer has already started there, Mike? Uh, <laughs> you've take, that's not good. Um, let me just say, uh, this is intimidating. Um, um, with the number of people here. Um, hopefully uh, it will be beneficial to you uh, and uh, we'll be able to provide some information that will be helpful for people in what is an, a very important uh, public policy issue for this province. Um, I have about 48 slides here, 47 slides. Uh, I will speak for the only for the hour. I understand that the importance of having questions and we'll try to answer any economic questions you have. I'm not an engineer, so there's no point in asking me engineering questions. I'm not, I, despite having a biology degree, there's no point in asking me environmental stuff. Uh, I don't remember it, so, uh, but, but I will try to answer the economics questions for you as best I can. Um, so uh, I just want to take you through a number of things. I want to let you know why we got involved in this, and uh, uh, I want to know, give you some sense of what, what was done, how it was done. Um, they're forecasting, you know, is there a need for the, uh, the, the project? Uh, what are the uh, what what are the uh, the options available to us? Like, can we price our way out of this here? As the CD Howe paper was talking about recently, that came out on January 11th. Uh, I want to talk about the cost uh, cost of alternatives and compare them. I want to tell you about how they uh, calculate supply prices and what some of the issues are around that. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, oil and pri oil and gas prices and LNG in particular and whether it's an alternative fuel. I will take you through a little bit about. Uh, your monthly fuel bills, as per what the minister talked about on the radio recently. I want to talk to you a little bit about shale gas as well, because these things are important. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about debt. And uh, then hopefully I'll give you some conclusions. But if I don't get through all of this material, this material will be on uh, Doug's website, uh, and uh, he can provide that to you after. Uh, about the website, and it'll be on the Harris Center website, and I think on the APEC website. So there is a, a PDF version of this that will be available uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so, uh, so let me just sort of take you through, uh, through this here. And uh, let me first off let you understand that I'm just one person here, and uh, you're going to see a lot of typos in this kind of thing, and that's the problem when you're one person working late at night and early in the morning and they're trying to teach and do all these kind of things. You get it done in time to have a presentation and consider all, of the, all the issues. I've thought about this quite a bit and, thought, uh, and, and worked through it a lot. So let me just, so if you can excuse the typos and those kind of things, uh, uh, we'll, we'll start. Uh, first, let me thank, thank the Harris Center and, and the Applied Economic Research and APEC for sponsoring this event. Uh, and I want to thank you for coming out. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's not the greatest night, and I want to thank you for letting me share my thoughts. Uh, 
I mean, um, I've been on the record as supporting this particular project a as a good project. Sorry, sir. Thank, no problem. Uh, uh, so I, I, I've been on the record as supporting this project as a good project, and then uh, Dr. Vardy uh, released this paper to the Harris Center, which raised a number of serious questions about this project, and it spurred me to have a closer look at uh, at this particular project. Now, I looked at it before. I mean, I, I looked at it and, and thought about it, but I mean, I know David quite well. I mean, he's a passionate, bright guy, uh, a good economist, a great Newfoundlander, and you know. Here's a guy who I think is quite bright, I have a lot of respect for, says, you know, there's some problems with this project. So I had, in my own mind, just to help my own self understand whether or not I had made the right decision about whether or not this was a good project or a bad project, I went back and had a look at David's paper quite a lot, and then had a look at lots of other kinds of things as well. So I, I went back and, and went to school on this and spent a lot of time trying to understand what this project was about. And so what you're going to see here tonight is the outcome of that reflection, which has taken probably a month, month and a half of pretty dedicated time going through stuff many hours of the day and night trying to figure it out. Now, uh, this has generated a lot of response in the media, um, some not so pleasant at times. Um, that's unfortunate, you know. I mean... People cheer you when, when you say something that's in their interest. And so it's like the tide. You know, it comes in, it raises you for a while, makes you feel good. And then at some point in time, when you say something you don't like, it goes out and you're let down, right? So, you know, if I have a choice, I prefer to be liked. I mean, that's, you know, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about whether I'm liked or not liked. But I am going to try to tell you, you know, what I am concerned about. The only thing I do have is my wife is here. Uh, my family, and uh, my professional integrity. Those are things I have. Those are things I care about. Uh, and so I'm not going to tell you something here I don't believe. I might not be right. Okay, I could be misinformed. I could be wrong. But I'm not going to tell you something I don't believe. That's the only thing that I have in my whole career. Okay? And I do have some technical ability to go through this stuff as well. Just... Okay. And so as an academic here at the university, I think it's important for me personally, and I think it's important for the university as well, but it's important for me personally to help people understand issues that are important to them, that affect their lives, okay? Uh, you know, if we can't do that, then we can't do very much at all, okay? Uh, I want to help people understand, to utilize the information that's available to them, and to plan their future, and hopefully to be more active and better participants in the democratic process. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, that's all I'm trying to do. This defines me as a person, defines me as a scholar. It's what makes me Wade Locke. Okay? It's important for the intellectual capital at the university to be applying these kinds of issues. Right? Not just simply sitting back in my office doing research and teaching. I do that as well. Um, we have a responsibility here to apply our expertise in ways to help people improve the society for current or future generations. I feel privileged, I know I'm privileged, to be in a position at the university where I'm receiving huge amounts of money, more than for what we're trying to do, just so you understand. I mean, I feel lucky to be here and to be able to come and do things that I find interesting, okay? So I'm not dismissing, you know, that I'm in a privileged position to be able to address these kinds of issues. Um, I just want to be able to contribute to their problems in some particular way. I, you know, I want to be helpful. I'm having fun doing this stuff, uh, to some degree. And uh, I find it interesting. <coughs> so. Now, let me get rid of this at the start. For the record, I'm not being paid to undertake this research. I do not represent anyone here, not the university, not the Harris Center, not the Applied Economic Research Initiatives, not the government, not the opposition, not NALCOR. The only person I represent here is Wade Locke. Okay? And that's on this issue. I'm not under contract in Alcor or the provincial government for anything pertaining to Muskrat Falls, just so you understand. As part of the environmental impact process, the joint review panel that we talked about, I was asked uh, as a, to be a subcontractor to look at 
economic impacts. There's employment and income associated expenditures associated with, with the lower Churchill. And I was asked to go to Labrador one day at the hearings and to answer any questions that people might have with respect to that. I do a lot of this kind of stuff, just so you understand. When Boise Bay was on the go, we did that as well. Just, you know. Uh, so I've been upfront about that. The reason I didn't get involved in discussing the Lord Church when we did the prosperity plan is because I had done that work. Okay? Now, that being said, nothing I'm saying here tonight, I'm not a spokesman for NALCOR. I'm not a spokesman for the government. I'm not a representative of NALCOR. I'm receiving no compensation for this, either direct or implied, right? Uh, I'm just presenting to you what I believe, right? So, and they're honestly held beliefs. They could be wrong, but they're honestly held beliefs, okay? You don't have to agree with them. You don't even have to believe them. But please accept that these are what I believe, and you can do whatever you want in terms of how you use the information. So, my hope that when you consider the information here tonight, and give it whatever weight you think is appropriate, even zero, and, and, and then use it to make your own conclusions about the, the project, because this is an important public policy issue for this province. It's indicated by the number of people here tonight. So let me, okay, now we have that over. I'm not under contract, anybody. I'm not doing this for money. Uh, I'm busy enough. I wasn't looking for more work to do, just so you understand. I, this is something I like doing in terms of trying to provide information for people to help them make their own decisions. I'm not here to try to sell you something. Uh, I will have a definite opinion. I'll tell you what my opinion is. I'm not shy about giving my opinion. Okay, I, I'm comfortable doing that. But let me let me take you through uh, this particular analysis. Uh, on one level, this is this is there's a couple of basic questions that we need to ask and, and answer. One is, do we need the power? If we don't need the power, then we don't have to go any further. The lecture is over. All right. Uh, so, looking at the best option, if you don't need the power, well, that's interesting. It's maybe moot, and that's what we do here at the university. We debate issues that you know might not be relevant for a lot of things, but they are fodder for lots of discussion to show how smart we are, right? So, uh, and, and we're pretty good at it. We have the expertise and the time to do it. We need the power, in my assessment, okay? So, if we need the power, can we avoid the need? Right? That's another question we need to ask. So, can we, for example, charge a high enough price so that people don't use electricity? The answer is yes, without a doubt. On a biggest yes. Can we educate people enough so that they get into conserving energy? Can we provide incentives, to aggressive demand side management? The answer is yes, we can do this kind of thing. Can it have an impact in the short term? Probably not. Pricing can. We can make the price high enough that you stop using electricity. I'll take you through that when I talk about the CD Howe paper in a moment. Okay, so if we can't get or avoid the need, what, the next question is, what's the least cost alternative? Okay, so if we can't, we can't forestall the need, what is the least costly way of doing it? So, whereas, can we avoid the need? Yes, we can. We can raise the price enough so that you sit in the cold or you come to the university to take showers or you sleep with people for body heat, not because you like them. <laughs> That's not what you, we want to do. There are some significant adjustment costs for people who cannot adjust to these kind of things easily. I can. If I want to put a new furnace in place, I have the revenue to do it. Most people who are going to be affected by this don't have that flexibility. I want you to understand that. So what is the least costly alternative way of doing it? When we consider the costs that are broadly defined, we mean financial cost, environmental cost, uh, economic development cost, and things such as enhanced oil revenues. Though all those things. So it's a simple question. What's the least costly way of doing it? How you answer that question is not simple. It is difficult. It is complicated. And as we've seen, it's generated quite a heated debate on this issue. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on that last question. So first I want to take you through what, what, did, they, what did NELCOR do? How did they come about and get these particular things? So the first thing they did was look. They said, OK, we have a, a, a project for Muskrat Falls that can generate 400 4,873 gigawatts, or 824 megawatts of power. That's how much they, they're using, OK? So they can generate that. And so what do you do next? They said, given this particular project, what are the capital costs? What are the operating costs? What are the payments to the ANU? What are the water power rentals and all those kind of things? So they got a cost of generating this amount of electricity. Uh, then they assumed 
initially said, let's assume that we're going to fund this 100% with equity. The government will give them money and they will fund it. And assume for the moment that we have a 12% rate of return. Now, 12% is an arbitrary number, but it's a number that's consistent with the rates of return earned by private utilities, okay? So, starting off with assumption of 12% rate of return. Then they assumed that the inflation rate that applies, or the escalation factor applied to electricity prices, would be 2%, it's consistent with a typical assumption for inflation. So, 2% per year. Then they calculated the price that would have to prevail in 2010 in order to give a 12% rate of return on the electricity generated in order to, if you sold it all. So if you sold it all, what price would have to prevail in, in 2010 in order to give you a 12% rate of return? Well, that number works out to, and you've heard this number in the public, 75.82, or 7.6 cents per kilowatt hour. So now they have this, what's called a supply price, a price. They have that price. Then they said, okay, we're going to allow this price to escalate at the rate of inflation. So at some point in time, it's going to go 2%, 2%, 2%. Okay? So now they've got a price that will grow over time at 2% per year. Then they apply this particular number to the energy that's going to be used on the island. Okay? And only to the energy that's going to be used on the island. Now that starts off with 2 terawatts or 2,000 gigawatts approximately per year and eventually climbs to 4,873, which is the capacity of the plant. So they're going to start off with some amount that's needed on the island, and then they're going to increase that as the load forecast demand increases, and they're going to apply a price to that. And the price is going to be 75.82, escalated by inflation each particular year. So from that, they can then calculate a revenue flow. Okay, so they're now applying a price to a, a quantity, and they get a revenue flow. And initially, they don't assign any value to the residual power. That is, the amount of power that doesn't go to Nova Scotia and is not needed on the island. And they don't assign any value to the power that goes to Nova Scotia, the 20% that people talk about. Okay? And that won't be available for revenue for Newfoundland until 35 years out. Okay? So 2051, basically. And if you plugged all those things together, what you'll get is an 8.4% rate of return on the project. Okay? Just so we understand how that works. So 8.4% will be the return to equity if they only sold to themselves the power that they generate and need in the years in which they need it at $75.82 per megawatt hour. In each year, as they need more of it, they get more revenue. And so when you do that, you get an 8.5% rate of return. That, to them, was sufficient to allow them to go out and borrow funds so they could be sure that they could pay back the loans and provide some equity to the state shareholder, which is the government of Newfoundland. Okay? So that was, that was how this was done. So right now, for the residual power that is not used immediately by the province but, and not used by Nova Scotia. They can sell that for export or they can use it for industrial development in Labrador, but right now there's no value attached to that. As you attach value to it, the 8.4% will go off, just so we understand that, okay? So now, let's, I, want you, I want you to understand as well, the provincial government right now can borrow at a rate that's less than 5%. So implicitly, that's the implicit cost of equity. So if you can borrow at 5% and you earn an 8.4% rate return, that's a pretty good rate of return, just so you understand. But the intention was never that they're going to borrow, uh, not borrow at all. So how they will borrow will depend upon at what rate they can borrow, what the revenue flows happen to be. And if they can borrow, for example, if the rate of return on the project is 8.4, and they can borrow at 7.2, which is about the rate that hydro can borrow at, the alco can borrow at, then the rate of return goes up. The more leverage you use, the higher is the rate of return to equity, so you understand how, how this technically works. Okay, so long as you can cover your debt servicing, you can borrow a certain amount. If you have a, if you have a loan guarantee, you can borrow more. Now, when you borrow more, what happens? The return to shareholders, that is, the government and the taxpayers, go up. Okay, so, so as you borrow more, if you can borrow at 7%, and you earn 8% return on it, the more you borrow, the higher will be the return left over for you as a shareholder. If we put the additional power in place, that is the difference between what Nova Scotia gets, the 20% commitment, and what the island needs, we sold that, what would happen is that the return would go up. 
So 8.4 would be a bigger number unless we lowered the price. So we're trying to get a, a particular rate of return, 8.4 or whatever the number is, we can lower the price that's required in order to give us 8.4 or we can take a higher return. So either the rate payers can, can benefit from a sale of the surplus power, the residual power, or the shareholders, so the taxpayers. Okay, well, we saw we shareholders. Okay, that's how they do it. Here is exhibit uh, one from the PUB. And all the information I think is public information that I have, except for one thing, which is what the Minister of Natural Resources talked about on the radio, and I asked him for a copy of it, just so you understand. We'll get to that later on. So this is their forecast for energy, uh, the, the need for energy in this province. It strikes me, and the big bump up is, is the, is the uh, Boise Bay project, just so you understand. This doesn't strike me as an unreasonable thing. What do they do? You've got people who are technically competent to do this stuff. Just so you understand. I mean, I've, I've sat down with these people. I asked them what they did. They have an econometric model, a fancy sort of thing. They, they plug numbers in, and it, the assumptions that they use are not unreasonable. They might not be, this won't be right. Just so you understand. This is not going to be right, right? So they have a way of predicting what the demand will be. This, to me, is reasonable. What I'm seeing here is reasonable, and how they did it. The people are technically competent. I, from what I can tell, I don't believe, I'm not talking about Mr. Martin, I'm talking about Mr. Bennett, I'm talking about the people who actually do this stuff, the bureaucrats that do this stuff. They're motivated by trying to do the best job they can. And there's no real gain to them to try to misrepresent something because there are technical people around who can do this stuff as well and prove you're wrong if they're wrong. Okay, so this is not unreasonable. When I was preparing for this tonight, I was trying to figure out how would I explain this. So I looked at, you know, you can predict people's weight by looking at their height. You can predict their weight by looking at their age. You can predict their weight by looking at their gender. You can put all that stuff into an econometric model. And I did that, and I plugged in my statistics. And what did I see? I found out I was a foot too short. <laughs> so that's the... The problem with that is, I mean, so the issue is, is this a reasonable approach? Without a doubt. Is this a reasonable result? Without a doubt. Do I believe that we're going to have a need for energy? Yes. Okay. So let me just show you, if I can. This is the isolated island component, and this is the muskrat. So what you're seeing here, this blue and the red, is the thermal generation associated with the, with the isolated island, and the green is hydro. This is Holyrood here, basically. This is hydro, and this is the infeed. So basically what you're seeing here, if you can have a look at this, what you're seeing here is that uh, as a result of the way the demand is going to grow, this is basically going to replace Holyrood and thermal generation with uh, hydropower. That's basically what's going to happen. So, so the blue is the thermal generation, the red is thermal generation. So at some point, Holyrood is going to stop, even under the island stuff. And they're going to have gas, uh, uh, I guess these gas kind of turbines or uh, some kind of special turbines that are in place here. And so that's what you're talking about. And this is what you're talking about in terms of uh, this is hydro, hydro, thermal, 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 hydro. So the difference is what? The difference is the amount of power that's going to be generated thermally or by hydro. Okay. Um, so... Can we, you know, if this is the case, can we do something to avoid this by educating people so you shouldn't leave your lights on when you're over here at the, at the presentation? Uh, we can build new capacity or we can raise prices, right? We can improve energy efficiency, we can raise prices. There's lots of things we can do. Okay, so from a conceptual hypothetical perspective, can we price ourselves out of this situation? Yes. Unambiguously, yes. Okay? You have a downward sloping demand curve, which is what we believe. Okay? Uh, in other words, so as long as it's not perfectly vertical, if I raise your price, you will cut back your demand, no matter what it is. So if I raise the price of chips, you'll cut back your chips if I raise it enough. Now, how much is enough is a different issue. But we can raise the price and keep raising it, so if 10% is not enough, let's do 20. If 20 is not enough, do 50. If not 50, 100. If not 100, 200%. So we can raise the price enough that you will stop doing what it is we want you to stop doing. We have to believe that as economists. Okay? We believe people respond to incentives. Okay, that's what we're saying to you, just so you understand. So can we raise the price? Yes, we can. Can we stop you from demanding electricity? Yes, we can. 
So do we not, can we do it so we don't need new capacity? Yes, we can. Unambiguously, yes. So the only real question is, how much? Right? And are we concerned about the adjustment cost that's got to come along with that? Because if we raise the price, I can go get a new furnace if I need to. I won't like it, but I can change the heating system in my house. I can put in energy efficient windows. I can do lots of things. Not everybody can do that. Right? And if we don't care about the adjustment cost we impose on people, then it's not, it's not much of a complicated problem. Right? Just raise the price. And keep raising it until it's no longer a problem. Just so you understand. So these things are not difficult conceptually. You raise the price until it's no longer a problem. The problem disappears. Let's have a look at the paper that was released. I mean, I know Jim Fian quite well. He's probably, not probably, is the best scholar in our department, by far. So he's a competent, good economist, Newfoundlander, stuff like that. So what did he, what did he do on January the 11th? He released a paper to C.D. Howe. And what did the paper say? If prices are increased to reflect the fuel price, then excessive power consumption will be curtailed, and this will make the expense of muskrat falls unnecessary. Is that a true statement? It is unambiguously true. We can make the price high enough so that is true. Okay? And he also advocates for time of year pricing and, if feasible, time of day. So time of year just means, in the wintertime, you'll pay a higher price for your energy. Why? Because we burn more thermally. We burn more thermally, it costs us more. So he goes through an example. In 2011, he says it cost $135 per megawatt hour to produce thermally, and we only pay $105 or 10 cents uh, per, per kilowatt hour. So implicit in that, we should increase the price by 30%. Because if we do it, um, then we'll make it equal to the cost. But he's, you know, what he says, no, you don't need to worry about that because we own, only 15% of the power comes from Holyrood, so we uh, don't need to have that big of an increase. We, if we could, for example, he has an elasticity around 0.25. That's not, unreason that's not an unreasonable number. That's, that's fine. It's somewhere around 0.3, but that, that's just a quibble. That's, that's neither here nor there. So he says, look, if you raise the price by 20%, you'll lower the demand by 5%. That is a reasonable assumption. Okay? So it implies, not stated, but implies, lets you believe that a 20% increase will remove the problem. Uh, first thing, here is a picture from Manitoba Hydro. Our Newfoundland rates, electricity rates, on a monthly basis, and 2,000 kilowatt hours, basically that's what that is, just so you understand, is when you have electric heat in your house. So we, somewhere around 2,000, if you, on, a, on a monthly basis, somewhere around 2,000, what you'd burn if you had electric heat. Newfoundland is somewhere in the middle here, a little below the average, but not substantially below the average. This is Manitoba Hydro. These are the ones who are doing the, uh, the report right now. You know, yes, are we lower? Yes, but not, not dramatically lower. I, I don't see that as, you know, we're not really subsidized relative to other jurisdictions. If you look at Quebec's website, these numbers are the same, just that they've chosen a different set to look at, just so you understand. So, you know, here we're at a fourth lowest, but again, we're not particularly out of line with the average, we're close. So you're hard pressed to argue that, you know, prices in Newfoundland are subsidized relative to other jurisdictions. They might be subsidized relative to the cost of electricity, uh, cost to thermal, but relative to other jurisdictions, it doesn't appear to be. There's a lot of words on the slide here. So basically what it comes down to is that if you look at these numbers here, what it's telling you is that 15% of the electricity generated in Newfoundland right now is generated by thermal, about 14% from Hollywood. So that allows Jim to say, okay, uh, if we can just raise the rate by 20%, we'll cut back demand by 5% and no problem. What he hasn't shown you in that stuff, if you look at the, uh, the forecast load in, from... from, um, from um, Exhibit 1 there we showed you. That's going to grow from 15% to 30% by 2041. And that's all thermal. So if you want to lower the need for thermal generation to 10%, you're going to have to lower the, the demand not by 5%, but by 20%. And using his numbers, you're going to need a reduction, an increase in prices, not of 20%, but of 80%. Right? So 
And if, if the prices go up 80%, you don't have to worry about muskrat falls. You won't need that either, just so you understand. This is, so, so, and there are significant costs associated with an increase in prices in terms of the people who need to adjust. I said, I don't have any problem adjusting. I won't like it, but I can do it. Financially, I can do it. My parents, on the other hand, might not be so easy to do it. They don't have the financial wherewithal that I have. Maybe I should be subsidizing their choice to go this kind of, and I probably would. But I want you to understand, there are people in this province that won't be in a position to be able to adjust. So they will suffer in the cold. There has to be a better way of making solid citizens out of people in this province, rather than freezing them. <laughs> we don't want that. I want you to understand time of year pricing. We have something called the Rate Stabilization Adjustment Plan in place in Newfoundland. Why do we have that? Because we, each year, at some point in time, we tell you what your price is going to be based upon the forecast for the price of oil. And we've done that. Why? Because prior to 1985, what happened? What used to happen? Every month, your electricity bill went up or went down depending on the price of oil. And what happened? You had all kinds of protests back then. People couldn't tell from one month to the next what was going to happen to their electricity bill. And as a result, you know, prices have gone up this year, right? They've gone up 7% as a result of this pro because of the price of oil. I want you to understand that, right? And the price of oil is going to cause prices to go up in Newfoundland from 2011 to 2016 or 2017 by over 20%. And there's still a need for new capacity. That, that you need to understand as well. So a 20% increase in price is not going to do it for you. But I thought Andy Wells' letter here to the PUB was an interesting one, right? He exp explains why he was reinforcing the PUB. He was the mayor of St. John's at that point in time. He was reinforcing the PUB why we had the rate stabilization plan in place in the first place. It's because you're hitting people the most vulnerable at the worst possible time. Right? You should, if you're concerned about social justice and those kind of things, this is something you should be worried about. Even if some economists can tell you it can be efficient, should be efficient. Efficient doesn't mean a hell of a lot in this kind of situation, so you understand. You better understand the adjustment costs that go along with this stuff. Right? People are hurt as a result of this stuff. You can't let people adjust to something and then say, sorry, we're changing the rules of the game. You put your baseboard heating in place, and now you're going to have to suffer. Either you can't afford to eat, or you're going to be cold. Okay? You have a choice. Walk around the mall, get warm, or don't eat. Which do you want to choose? Even if it's efficient to do it that way. Efficiency doesn't mean an awful lot. There's an infinite number of efficient points, just to understand. There's a lot of allocation. If I have everything, you have nothing, that's efficient. You have nothing and I have everything, that's efficient. It may not be desirable, but it's efficient. You need to understand when we talk about these technical things as if they're desirable, those are value judgments or opinions that economists use. Just so you understand. Being efficient doesn't mean desirable. And I believe in this stuff thoroughly, just so you understand. <laughs> I want you to understand here, this is, all this is a series of numbers. This particular, this is the 12% figure that we talked about, and this is where they got the price. So what they did, so that there is this much energy over the time period. That's the amount of energy that's going to be created. If you adjust for inflation, that's the number. And this is the, the cost, if you want. That would be the number for this particular project in terms of dollars required. Capital operating, inu payments. Uh, water power rentals. If you put that in present value terms, you get a 12% discount rate. These are the numbers you'll get. You divide one by the other, this number by this number, it'll tell you you need $75.82 per megawatt hour in order to get a 12% rate of return. Okay? So if you apply that to those things, if you use 11%, you would get $67.35. That's what you'd need to get 11% rate of return. A 10% return, you'd need 59, or 5.9 cents per kilowatt hour, 6.7, or 7.6 cents per kilowatt hour. The number you choose for the rate of return will have a direct bearing on the price that you need to charge. It is an arbitrary, to some degree, arbitrary decision which price you, you charge, which rate of return. They have decided that 12% is appropriate. It is a public policy decision whether or not we want to have a high return to shareholders, a high return to taxpayers, 
and a higher price to ratepayers or a lower price to ratepayers and less of a return to taxpayers. That's a public policy discussion. It is not for Nalcor to decide, but it is for us as the public and the government to make a decision on, just so you understand. So in other words, what I'm trying to say to you here is that we could choose 10% instead of 12. And if we chose 10 instead of 12, we'd be charging a price of 5.9 cents instead of 7.5 cents, just to give it a feel for it. So there are, and, and you can't go too low because you need to be able to pay your debt. Okay, if you go too low, you can't get there. You can't get there from here. Okay? But we can have some flexibility in whether it's 12 or 11 or 10, because we still can probably pay the debt with that, especially with the residual power that we're talking about. So this is the implied, so in other words, this is just a, a picture of that table. Okay? It shows you the higher the rate of return, the higher the required price for a given amount of energy in order to get the, the, the specific rate of return. So the lower the required return, the lower is the price you can charge and still get the parameters you defined. Whether it's 12% appropriate or 11% appropriate, that's a debatable point. It is something we certainly should think about and talk about as a public. How can we leave that? I want to show you, this is the, this is the undiscounted differences in terms of the isolated island and muskrat. So if we had no discounting whatsoever, the cost would be $41 billion in total in favor of muskrat. If we allow for discounting, so the number you have seen publicly is 2.2 billion in present value terms. So that's what this number here is. So the cost associated with the isolated island is 8.8 billion. The cost associated with Muskrat Falls in present value terms is 6.7 billion. So we get about 2.2 billion as a difference. So whatever you do, whatever you do, you're going to make up a difference of 2.2 billion dollars. And you see, the reason for this is because of the fuel charges are different in one versus the other. So what we have is a big capital project and low operating cost. Or we have a, a smaller capital project and a high operating cost. It's like Voices Bay versus Lab City. Voices Bay has what? A fly-in, fly-out option, really high cost on an operating basis. Capital cost in terms of the mine site, town site, not so high. Lab City, big town site, but people live there. So you don't have to fly them in and fly them out. So whether or not you go one or the other will depend upon how, whether or not the length of time for the high operating cost can outweigh the high capital cost. Right now, what we're seeing here is that right now, there's a $2.2 billion differential. So in order to say that the isolated island is better than the hydro, the net Muscat Falls, you've got to make up $2.2 billion worth of difference. And how can you do that? We can do that by changing the fuel cost. So if you can get a cheaper fuel, as Mr. Vardy was talking about, in terms of gas, natural gas, or LNG, is it possible that we can get a lower price for those, and it can be low enough to make up $2.2 million? And then, of course, we have to worry about whether or not there's industrial demand for Labrador. Do we have, how, do we, how do we make that up, even if we get a, a cheaper fuel? And then we have to worry about greenhouse gases, because when you're burning fuel, there's going to be greenhouse gases. So, but let's not that those are quibbly kind of things. Let's not worry about that right now. So you've got to make up $2.2 billion. So let's go through, see if we can figure out how to make that up. So here's, here's the isolated island in present value terms using 8%. Here's Muskrat with 8%. See, what you can see here is um, the fuel charges are the red area. The fuel charges are the red area here. The, the blue area are the fixed charges. That's the capital cost, just so you understand. And the green area is the cost to the ratepayer because they're selling power from muskrat to the, to the people who distribute it here. So what you're seeing here is that this, when you add these numbers up, there's about a $2.2 billion difference in this diagram in favor of muskrat. So muskrat is $2.2 billion cheaper. But what you can see here, big red area, if we make that big red area smaller, that is get a cheaper fuel, then maybe these things can be made to be similar. Oh, what did I have? I went too far, did I? No. Oh, I've lost a slide somewhere along the way. Ah, but anyway, uh, is it possible? Without a doubt, it is possible. I can concoct, I can develop, I can construct a scenario where that red area gets small enough so that this number adds to this number. 
How much? Well, we've got to lower the cost of oil from where it's at to about 35% of where it's at, or 65%, like two-thirds. The price of oil is going to be two-thirds of what they use in this analysis. So if the price of oil were not $90, what they use at starting point, but were $60 or less, then I can construct a scenario whereby this number adds to this number. In other words, I can make the two scenarios equivalent. Now, I still got to worry about greenhouse gases and charges for carbon at some point in time, which will add about another 80 and 90 million dollars per year to the cost. And I've got to worry about how do, if I do this and make it cheaper for thermal in Newfoundland on the island, how am I going to supply the 500 plus megawatts of power for the mining activity that's expected in Labrador? Because that won't solve this. That's another issue we need to think about. So what did Nalcor do in terms of prices, just so you understand? Well, it's a good choice of colors there, I'll tell you that, huh? Uh, so these are the prices that they used. These are, except for here, these are the annual increases in the prices that they used. And this was, so, uh, so basically, they, their fuel prices reached about $133 uh, in 2025, just to give you some perspective on it. Uh, um, Others, for example, predict that the price will be about 120. And so, so this is a little higher, without a doubt. So they're starting off with, for example, about $88. The Environmental, uh, Environmental Information Agency, the Energy Information Agency in the U.S., recently, the last couple of days, put out a new forecast where in 2012 the price is expected to be $100. Okay? So these numbers are not what some people say and they're smaller than other people say, but they don't strike me as uh, particularly unreasonable. Okay? Um, so if you want to make up the cost differential, you're going to have to assume that prices are somewhere between $50 and $60. Okay? So now, if you can convince yourself of that, that not, not a particular year, because we can do that. If you look at back to the recession we had in 2008, 2009, it went down to $33. So yes, that's possible. Long term, not a chance. Not likely. Okay? We're looking at anywhere between eighty to hundred dollars for the price of oil long term real terms, not fifty to sixty. So if bet if you're assuming that the price of oil is gonna fall, so that this becomes feasible, not likely. Improbable. Let me take you through some prices just so you get a feel for why I'm saying this kind of stuff. This is the this is the price of Brent and WTI. And what you can see is I'm using WTI for my analysis. You can see that for years, many, many years, these were the same price, except for last year, started to diverge, and now it's coming back together. Okay, there's a gap. There shouldn't be a gap. WTI is a better quality oil. It should sell for, in the same markets, more or less the same price. And typically it does, except for last year. And the reason for that is because of the, the pipelines and what was going on in Cushing, Oklahoma, and all those kind of things. And we can ask them those questions if you want at, at the end. But using WTI as a reference price is probably not a bad thing to do. Okay? Here's the, this is the, uh, the price of WTI and the heavy fuel oil that they use as bunk, what we know as Bunker C. Okay, so you can see that in, in recent years, these numbers are close to like about 90% differential. Okay? So it's just so you get a feel for it. So Bunker C is somewhere around 90% currently of the WTI. Okay? So we can use WTI and, and figure out whether or not the prices that were used by Nalcor are reasonable for oil. They might be a little high, but they're reasonable. Okay? I don't know what's going on here. Okay. Uh, just so you get a feel, these are our forecasts uh, that are put forward, publicly available forecasts. You can see that the price of oil is expected to go up. It's certainly in real terms, it's, this is the price for uh, GLJ, uh, which is a publicly available one. This is no more or less credible than other ones. Will these guys be right? They won't be right either. None of these guys will be right, just so you understand. But this is reasonable. So somewhere between $80 and $100, in my mind, real terms, is a reasonable price. So it's not going down to 50 to 60. It may go higher. It may go a little lower. But, you know, these kinds of numbers are not, not too bad. And if you look at the oil sands, this is from the National Energy Board, they're going to need somewhere between... 85 and 95 dollars and 2010 dollars just to break even with a typical project and right now we're expecting oil sands to double and triple and that can't do that without those kinds of prices 
And so that's what you should expect the long-term price to be in that range, 80 to 100. Okay, anywhere in there is okay. If you're predicting more than that in real terms, then you've got a problem on your hands. If you're predicting less than that, you also have a problem on your hands. These are the reference prices used by the NEB. So basically, they're predicting $90 in 2011, and it'll grow to $115 in, uh, in 2035. Uh, so with 2% inflation, that's equal to, these numbers get very big very quickly, equal to about $200, okay, in, in 2035. Henry Hub price, and I want to make sure you understand this stuff, is currently, oh, well, currently it's less than, uh, less than $3. But they're predicting $450 uh, and rising to $8 in 2010, $2010, um, and that's equivalent to about $1340 in, in current uh, inflated dollars, okay? So price of natural gas is expected to go up, price of oil is expected to go up, okay? If nothing more than just inflation. Okay, the, and this is what the forecasts are for the Henry Hub. So you can see that these numbers are going up. So you can haul these things off. It's not, what I want to emphasize here, it's not $4 for a very long period of time. It's more than $4. It'll grow from 4 to whatever. In real terms, it'll go up to 6 and plus. So I think the expectation is, in real terms, 6 to $7 is where the price of natural gas will be. So when people talk about the price of natural gas being cheap, it is. Okay? So these are the forecasts, just so you can get a feel for that. So it's expected to grow from about uh, four and a half cents to uh, seven or eight cents in nominal terms up to 2035. So the price is expected to go up, not a lot, but it's expected to go up. So how could we use the fuel? This is the diagram I, I thought I'd lost, but there it is. Uh, so if we can make this area smaller, right? There's no fuel cost, so if we, if we make the fuel price cheaper, by assumption, we can get this diagram to look like this, okay? And if we do that, we can make this diagram, which is the one on the right, look exactly like that in, in terms of the sums. So the difference between the one on the left, which is assuming a lower price for energy, two-thirds, we can make the thermal generated project in cost terms, look exactly like the hydro one. And you should ask yourself whether two-thirds of the price of oil, 50 to $60, is credible, but that's, that's a different issue. Can we make this differential disappear? The answer is yes. Then we're going to have to add something back in for greenhouse gases. We're going to have to add something back in for uh, 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 loss, well, something back in for uh, industrial development in Labrador. So let's turn to natural gas. The price of natural gas should be about six to one in terms, so for a, a thousand cubic feet versus a barrel of oil, there should be a factor of six to one. So the price of oil should sell for six dollars more than the price of oil, uh, the price of oil should sell for six dollars more than the price, price of natural gas per thousand cubic feet. So the price of natural gas is four dollars, price of oil should sell for twenty-four dollars. Clearly, that's not the case, right? So this is around 8.5. 8 that could be explained by transportation or market segmentation, lots of things. But you can see, look, this number is here, 20 and 30 percent, 20 and 30 times. So that means what? That in terms of the energy content, we, sh we can buy natural gas for a lot lower, not 6 to 1, but 30 to 1, a lot lower than we can buy oil for. So it's possible, it seems possible, that we might be able to get natural gas for a low enough price that we can substitute natural gas for oil and make the thermal better, right? And, and that makes sense. I mean, that, that seems reasonable to me, looking at this stuff. If you look at these prices here, this is, uh, this is about eight and a half, but look over here, it's 20 and 30. So it seems to me that on energy content, we should expect to be able to buy gas at a low enough price that we can substitute oil and make the thermal more attractive. So we still got to worry about the greenhouse gases and the environmental issues around there. Um, but if we can do this at a low enough price, there is no financial implication, right? Uh, the question would be, which is the lowest cost of energy delivered to Newfoundland? That's a separate issue, right? You're going to have to take account of the, the impacts on the environment associated with thermal versus hydro, and, and that's not unimportant, just so you understand. I want you to, people talk about LNG, and they think LNG 
they look at the Henry Hub price of uh, three to four dollars and say, "Isn't that a cheap fuel?" And the answer is yes. But to get LNG, to get gas from Henry Hub to here, what do you got to do? You got to turn it into a liquid. You got to chip it, and then turn it back into a gas. There's a value chain here. So they start off here. This is the the production. It gets turned into a, a, a liquid. Then it gets shipped, shipped over here, and stored, and then turned back into a gas, and then used to generate electricity. So there's a value chain associated with LNG. And there's a cost associated with LNG. So Henry Hub prices, you have to add something to those in order to get the price of gas delivered to Newfoundland. So um, I, I want you to understand that right now LNG sells around the world for lots of different prices, not the Henry Hub price. So if you're going to Japan, for example, or Asia, these prices are $16 to $17, as expensive as oil. And they're tied to the price of oil. Okay? So if I have an option of, of selling gas to you in Newfoundland or gas to you in Asia, and you want to sell it to me, you need to sell it to you for $4, and they're willing to pay $16.50, well, boy, if you're not willing to pay $16.50, you're not going to get it. However, we do expect the price of natural gas to come down. This is driven by, these high, high natural gas prices are driven by what? They're driven by the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster, and that if Japan wants to be warm, they've got to burn electricity, get electricity from natural gas. That's the only option they have available to them, unless they're prepared to take another, uh, another disaster. Um, okay. But Henry Hub is not LNG. That's the message. Germany, for example, are, are, are going to be cutting out all their power plants all the nuclear power plants by 2022. The Fukushima disaster is going to be a long time before Japan comes back and goes nuclear. Uh, so LNG is increasing. The demand for LNG is increasing. So is the supply. But we don't have a fully traded market at this point in time. What would be the long-term price? Who knows? It could be the price of oil, or it could be the price of Japan, or it could be LNG plus the cost of transporting LNG from Henry Hub to here. Um, we're going to need, just so you understand what these numbers here tell you, we're going to need somewhere around five to six dollars per thousand cubic feet or per million BTU, same thing, just so you understand, uh, in order for the thermal option to be equivalent to the hydro option. Now, is five to six dollars credible? Well, in order to answer that question, I went back and looked at a new LNG facility starting up in Louisiana. They're going to start producing in 2015. It's called the, if you want to look it up, it's called the Sabine Pass LNG Facility. It's uh, Ch uh, Cherney, Cherney Energy's new facility. On their website, they, for their investors and for anybody who wants to look, they tell you what they're going to need to get in order to break even. And so, if you look at these numbers here, and this doesn't include regasification, so you understand Newfoundland. This is just turning it into a liquid and transporting it to Newfoundland. You have to add another 50 to 60 cents per million BTU to add, but that's, that's, that's just a detail. To get Henry Hill prices at $4, you're going to have to add 315 just to cover off the transportation and the cost of turning it into a product. So they're not going to sell it to you for under, under $7.15. They're going to try to sell it to you for what they can get for in Japan for the price of oil, those kinds of things. That's what they would like to get. But you can rest assured the minimum they'll charge you is whatever it costs to turn it into a product and sell it to you and move it to you. The fact you might be telling me that I can get bananas in Costa Rica for two cents is kind of irrelevant because when I go to Sobeys, it's going to cost me more than two cents. Why is the difference? Well, somebody has to turn it into a product, move it here, and then sell it to me. Right? That's what this is talking about. So we need to add 3 to $4 to the Henry Hub price. So if you add $4 to 3 or $4, you took that $7 or $8 in terms of cost, LNG delivered to the province, then you've got to add another 50 to 60 cents for regasification. And those are not competitive. You can't beat hydro with seven or eight dollars for, for for gas. Domestic natural gas. We have 12 TCF of gas off our shores, right? 
There is no domestic natural gas industry right now, just so we understand. Right? There's no public plans that I know of to develop natural gas right now. Right? So you're going to have to think about how to use this stuff. There's not even a natural gas royalty in place. Right? That's the problem. Natural gas is currently being used for energy, uh, to, to burn electricity on the rigs, and for pressure maintenance. That's the most effective thing they can do right now with their gas. Okay? None of the currently available studies, and I looked at them all. I looked at Mr. Bruno's, uh, a number of presentations he gave. I look at the thing on the, on the website uh, for the PUB in terms of the uh, Pan Maritime Kenny pipeline study. They're asking different questions. They're dealing with different issues. None of the studies on natural gas domestic will allow you to have a definitive response with respect to whether or not this could be done at a cheap enough price to outbeat oil. It is unlikely, and there are no plans right now, and it may take another 10 years before gas gets developed. And we can't wait 10 more years before we do that. And we're talking now about what? A new conceptual design for generating this stuff. Just think of how long it's taken us to get to where we're at in terms of the lower Churchill. Right? So now you're talking about saying, nope, scrap all that, and let's do a new conce conceptual design, years in the process, and what are you going to do in 2020 when you're pushing up against demand? Demand's pushing up against supply. Because you won't be through it by then. So you wait long enough, natural gas off new land will be developed. I can't see any study that I've seen so far, and I've looked, and I've looked a lot, and I've read them all, that allows me to say that this is economic. Okay? You need 8 to $10 before gas offshore Newfoundland becomes economic to develop in terms of LNG shipping to Europe. We're not there yet. We expect to get there at some point, but we're not there yet. I've got five minutes left. Uh, this is what the minister talked about on the radio recently. This is the price. This, is the, this yellow line is what we've had for electricity bills, your monthly bills, assuming the average consumption. This black line is what's going to happen now. If we don't do anything, this is what's going to happen. So prices are going to rise from 179 to 217 between now and 2016 because of the expected increase in the price of oil. That's going to go up anyway. And then we have Muskrat Falls coming on, and there's going to be higher cost for the consumer initially for a small period of time. And then it flattens out. Once you built the facility, the costs go up only with inflation at that point in time. You have some control over it. So these are your monthly bills with hydro. These are your monthly bills with thermal. OK? Clearly, except for a very small period of time, our prices are not going to double in any event. But the thermal generation doesn't strike me as being superior in terms of prices to individuals relative to the Hydro or the Muskrat Falls. Okay. Shale gas. People talk about shale gas. What's shale gas? Well, shale gas is a new source of gas that's available really cheaply in an abundant supplies. What does that do? It lowers the price of natural gas. Now we're saying under $3 at times. It's abundant in supply and can be developed really cheaply. And it's not a hype. It has changed the market. It'll impact on how we can export rev the export revenue we're going to earn on Mus Muskrat Falls or Gull Island. Okay. I just thought, and I thank my Claire for pointing this out to me. This was an interesting article in the Globe recently. Without shale gas, we're expecting the price of oil and energy to go up by a factor of five. With shale oil, it only go double. Still will go up. Okay. So part of the reason the prices are so depressed now is because people had to drill in order to maintain the license. And so a lot of natural gas came on stream because of shale. And shale is a new phenomenon. This is the most recent, within days, forecast that came out from the guys to do this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a called a potential gas committee. This came out in 2011. Uh, what I want to show you here is that this is shale. This, this, this dash line here, shale. You can see that prior to this, shale wasn't even big enough for them to even take into account. It wasn't even worth their trouble to talk about. That's changed. It's changed quite dramatically. Shale will dominate not only U.S. gas, but everybody else's gas as well. Let me continue on. And this is just to show you uh, um, how shale is the green area. 
the, this is what shale gas is going to make up of U.S. production. Big, big supplies. Lots of them around. To the point that New York won't be importing gas, but will be exporting gas. It changes that dynamic quite a lot. Borrowing, debt. Borrowing for Churchill Falls, Muskrat Falls, will put us into a big problem with debt. Well, these numbers here, just so you understand, what I did was, for different amounts of borrowing, three, four, five, six, seven, eight billion dollars, what would it cost over a 30-year period, okay, if the interest rate were five, six, seven, eight, and it's under five right now, just so you understand? How much would we have to generate in every year in order to pay off, let's say, five billion dollars worth of debt if the interest rate was seven percent? Well, we'd have to generate at least $400 million a year in order to pay off the debt. Any over $400 million will allow us to pay off the debt and then have something left over to, to either pay off other debt or to fund public services or to give back to the ratepayers. Are the revenues from the Muskrat Falls greater than $400 million? The answer is un unambiguously yes on average. Unambiguously yes. And so when you say borrowing, it's like I'm going to borrow to build a restaurant. And it's going, I'm going to have to service the restaurant because I've got a debt thing, I've got to pay my employees, stuff like that. So long as the revenue coming in allows me to pay my employees and meet my debt obligations over a certain time period and then have something left over, I don't have a debt obligation, I don't have a debt problem. So this is meant to show you in some way or another, in a cute sort of way, that we don't have a debt problem in terms of Funding, because the price that we'll pay the 75.82 per megawatt hour is more than enough for the energy that's available without considering the residual power or industrial power being sold in Labrador. And I guess I'm sort of uh, getting close to the end here. I know I'm at the, so we don't, have a, we don't have a debt problem. Okay? Let me just... Uh, uh, I want you to understand. I'm almost, I'm almost there. Just give me, just give me a minute. Uh, take five. Well, there you go. Because Mike started the clock early. Um, <laughs> uh, Lower Churchill is an important project for a lot of reasons. It's an enabling function as well. Just to understand, it's not just about export revenue. It's not just about reducing greenhouse gases. You know, without a connection north to North America, some form or another, we're not going to be able to develop other kinds of things like wind or, or alternative energies because we can't bring them onto the system. We need to be able to export these kind of things. So if you want to have wind in Labrador or wind here, you're not going to be able to do it unless you have, unless you have uh, some alternative way to, 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 to use it. So that's what, what's this, what the, the, the Maritime Link will do for you. It'll give you a way to export power that otherwise you couldn't, might not be able to use. Okay? And, I, you know, uh, and it might give you a way to monetize natural gas, although I doubt it very much. Conclusion. On the balance of probabilities, it seems reasonable to me to assume that the Muskrat Falls is the best option for this province. Now, there are scenarios that we can con construct, okay? Without a doubt, I can construct scenarios and, uh, you know, the long-term price has got to be between 50 and 60,000. I just don't believe it. It's not credible. But, you know, maybe you can convince yourself that's okay. Not extending the public review for, uh, for the PUB, in my mind, is a problem. It creates a suspicion that it's unneeded. If they need three more months, give them three more months and let them do it, right? That doesn't, that doesn't take up my time. Uh, uh, so I, you know, if I were asked, I was not asked, I'm not going to be asked, but if I were asked, I would say, give them the time. Three more months is not going to mean very much or anything, and it allows you to avoid the suspicion that people have that you're trying to hide something. There's nothing to hide here. This is a good project, and it can be demonstrated to be a good project. You don't have to force a benefit on somebody. You might have to explain to them why it's beneficial. Eat your vegetables because it's good for you. You'll live longer, right? But you might have to explain it to them better so they can fully understand it. Assuming that the rate of return does not fall below some level, we can play with the rate. It's a public policy issue. What is the required rate of return, and therefore what is the required price? That's a public policy issue, okay? That's debatable. That's not for the Court, that's for us. That's for the government, for us. Without the energy made available to Muskrat Falls, there is serious questions about whether or not the mining projects that are 
talked about in Labrador, Rio Tinto going double, Alderaan going forward, Lab Mag going forward, Voice of A on the ground. We have eight, 80 megawatts of recall power in the wintertime. That's enough for one project and not a big one. Okay, just so you understand. Every eight million metric tons of iron ore requires about 40 megawatts of power. So you can start doing those kind of math if you want. So we're looking at five to 600 or four to 500 and higher megawatts of power needed for industrial development in Labrador. And if you don't do Muskrat Falls and other hydro developments on the island, you won't be able to meet that. It is true that we don't have any purchasing power agreements in Labrador at this point in time. It is also true these projects moving forward. And we'll need it. The export link increases the chance of alternative energies on the island, such as wind, that it will get developed. I think we have a problem if we don't do that. We won't be able to develop those kinds of things. Finally, energy is needed, and we should not be afraid to, fully inform, to make a fully informed decision to proceed if that's in our best interest. Right? This remains true even if we can, can point to decisions that we made stupidly in the past. The upper church of contract. Just because we made mistakes in the past doesn't mean that we shouldn't make decisions in the future. Right? We should learn from our history, but we shouldn't be slaves to it. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Wade. Uh, now is the fun part. We're going to start our mics on the left-hand side. Uh, we're going to work from left to right to try to manage the number of hands I expect we're going to have. So you can put your hand down now because I'm going to start against the wall. Uh, you're going to get two minutes max. Jessica has the, uh, the timer for when you start talking with your question, comment. Hopefully, they'll be clear and succinct. Uh, it's in the dialogue. The real lear learning occurs. Uh, there's been a lot of spin on both sides of the issue recently. Uh, the Harris Center is a spin-free zone. Substance, please. There's also been nastiness from both sides recently. We are here for respectful discussion of important issues. Got it? Okay, we have two wireless mics. We're going to start in the section against the wall. Then we'll move to the left-hand side of the middle section, then the right-hand side of the middle section, then the right-hand side. And we got two mics, and I got a light right in my eyes. So, Rebecca, do you have someone up there? Okay, and where's our mic down here? Johan? Against the wall there, a gentleman with his hand up. Two minutes. Um, I have a question about, uh, you dismissed pretty much the option of higher price as a way to, to so we don't have to, uh, at additional capacity, uh, and argument was that it will incur too much of the hardship, especially on the people who are less uh, able to withstand it. But this assumes that all money which you collect in the extra rates are money grab, so they're just going somewhere else. If instead you use this money, pay back every single dollar, so this is uh, revenue neutral, you offset most of the problems, in part because if you pay back in, for, in, a, in, let's say, in a proportion for each household, then those households which use more energy will be net losers, but those which actually use less energy will be net gainers. And then, in fact, you may actually help those people who struggle with the energy now, with, with the prices of energy now. Furthermore, you will dissociate the, the cost you will make the investment more, uh, it will pay for, uh, quicker for itself, because now if the, money, if the electricity costs twice as much, it will pay it much faster. It costs twice as much, but you got the difference back in a form of dividend or in a form of um, tax relief or whatever. But, so I think there is a way to do the increase in price to make it more real without actually incurring uh, and due duress uh, on especially vulnerable part of the society. Thank you. And Rebecca.
Rebecca, gentleman with the light blue shirt halfway down at the end. Are we going to respond to these questions? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, without a doubt, we can mitigate some of the adverse impacts. And so what, what, what the gentleman was saying there was that if we charge a higher price, what's the implication of a higher price? Well, there'll be higher dividends for, for NALCO and for the government, and they can use that to do, for example, if people are unduly hardshipped, uh, we can provide you a subsidy like your heat subsidy right now in terms of the, 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 the $150, whatever it is the government gives you to help you out. Um, that's I'm true. Just, I'm just insane. Yeah, no, I understand. $100 million collected, yep. pay all $100 million back for each uh, family. Uh, uh, in the yeah, and, 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 and the, the implication for rate payers versus income payers, the income distribution will be different without a doubt will be different. Can you design a system that you will minimize the significance of, of the increase in price? Yes, you can, without a doubt. Whether or not it will completely eliminate, I don't think so. But it requires a much more substantial uh, period of analysis than simply saying it is possible. Is it possible? It is possible. Is it likely? Not likely. And you know, are you going to be able to limit all the distribution locations to the most vulnerable in society? The answer is not a chance, not a chance. But you can minimize the implication for their adjustment, no doubt. In other words, we can use the additional revenue, because like if you charge uh, double the price, NALCO will be really profitable and be able to remit a whole pile of revenues to the provincial government, and they can use that for the kind of things you talked about. Right? They can give you a subsidy so that if you're below some income level, you will pay for a certain amount uh, of whatever it is. We'll give you an income supplement in some particular way. So that's that's possible. I don't think on the surface right now that we can hope that that will eliminate all of the negative components of an adjustment that will come about. There are some people in society, the most vulnerable, that just won't be able to take advantage of that stuff. Well, actually, I would argue that I think okay. that those who are okay. poor already with less than average of energy, so therefore, actually, there would be a beneficiary okay. such a system. Okay. And you have to take out the NALCO from your screen because take 100 million, take it out of their hands, and put, pay to each every family, to every household, uh, the same amount. Fine. I mean, All right, we'll move to the next question. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get you next time around, because I did have the light in my eyes. Gentleman against the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my name is Craig Lewis. Um, uh, I'm here as a Newfoundlander, first of all, but I'm also part of the Occupy. Uh, basically, my calculations is that uh, at uh, 484 gigawatts, and we're selling it at 75 cents a kilowatt, we're only getting 369 million. So we don't even cover the 5% that you mentioned there earlier. Um, why raise, you know, we're raising money to build this project. Why don't you give it to the people? We can r reduce our electricity rates by building our own supplies of alternative en energies, which was not highlighted in this, in this presentation, actually. Um, we should be investing in natural gas according to the rates that you show there, how they're much they're going to be improving over the next 35 years. Um, and for, with regards to, I worked offshore in oil and gas. We can go out, we can get a tanker right now, go out, fill up with the natural gas. We can ship it in, put it to the dock, and pipe that into the actual burner. So we don't need a big infrastructure to do something like that. Certainly not billions of dollars. Um, with regards to, I think the future here is wind energy. And a lot of the, the, I guess, the issues around it is how to uh, create the energy when we don't have the wind. But there's many different technologies out there, such as batteries, as we know, but they're obviously costly. There's a system out there called hydrostat. What we do, we put compressed air in bags underneath the water, and we store that in there. And then when the wind is not blowing, which is not very often here in Newfoundland, we always got wind, the air is released from the bags, and it, and it helps uh, generate energy through the turbines. There's also uh, ceramic capacitors that are being built. We have the capacity for cobalt here on the province and also um, for creating or mining another type of, uh, you know. Okay, you can clue it up. And also there's hydrogen, which is probably the best form. We are surrounded by water. We can take the water, we can split the particle to make hydrogen and oxygen out of that. We can burn that gas. That technology is here now. It will not cost us a lot because we're creating the power to okay, actually create done. the gas. Thank, Thank you. you. Wade, do well, you want to address well, some me, of those? Well, I mean, I'm not an engineer, so, you know, you're telling me something that 
you know, fine. I mean, you know, you need to talk to the people who are the engineers and this stuff and say, these are viable alternatives. From what I can tell, they've considered issues, and what they come down with is two possible ways of doing it. Um, one is with the thermal, and one is with the, is one with the hydro. Um, there, there may indeed be other things with enough time, enough research and development that these can be done. Without it, that wind will be an important part of natural resource uh, development in Newfoundland over a period of time. Whether or not this can come on stream and be at a sufficient level by 2020 is a different issue. Uh, I'm not going to argue. I'm not no, going to argue with it. I, I understand. I understand the point you made. I'm not the person to, to answer that one way or the other. So we're not going to resolve every energy option in the full continuum here tonight. We're going to address the stuff that Wade's able to address. Yep. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to intersperse questions from the hall with questions that are emailed or tweeted in. Uh, Mike, do you have any yet? Okay, Boyne, you want to get the mic to Mike? And then we're going to go to the left-hand side here. I'll get back to you when I get back in the next cycle, I promise. We'll take two from the web now, and they may be from our overflow rooms. You're not just making it up, are you, Mike? No, no, we, we, did, we, we lost it. We lost, we lost the flow. It. Oh, so we'll keep going? Okay, we're going to go to the left-hand side of the middle section here. Gentleman right with the leather jacket. Johan, right dead center there. And Rebecca, find someone up the top then for the next one. Gentleman right at the back, actually, was really early. And we'll get you on the next round, sir. For me now? Or? Yep, you're on. Uh, yes, uh, hi, my name is Fred Windsor and I'm the Conservation Chair with Sierra Club Canada. And uh, I guess a ma major problem I have is just the, the energy generation model that's up on the, on the board. But I can understand it because it's NALCOR's and it's, it reflects NALCOR's who they are. A hydroelectric company uh, involved in oil um, and uh, some thermal generation. But essentially, um, they haven't done any research. We want to talk about wind. They haven't done any research on wind in 30 years. So that's like buying a computer 30 years ago and then going and buying a computer today. Uh, the, the world has changed massively, and it's not reflected in this project at all, uh, which is unfortunate. What I, what I think I'd like to see anyway is some exploration of the various kinds of energy generation options we have. Like, what's available? I mean, we have the best wind energy in all of North America. There's nobody even close to us. On top of that, you have a situation now where the cost of wind turbines is dropping. So what are the economics of all of that? And plus, this whole notion that wind is intermittent in Newfoundland, hello. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's just not, it's, I mean, but it's not on the board here at all. And I think that's a, that's a big thing. And the cost, I okay, think, would be... Blew up. Okay, I just, but I think the cost, you'll be looking at a complete different set of numbers. Thank you. Let me just say the following. Uh, I mean, again, you're, you're making statements that, that I don't know and can't refute. But let me just say the following to you. Um, you and the audience should be aware or should, should, be, should be informed that uh, right now there is an RFP out uh, for a road mapping exercise for wind here in the province. And they're in the process of, of evaluating proposals they have for that. And so they're in the process of looking at what it would take to move from where we're at to having wind as a viable alternative and all the things that go along with that. So that's currently right now being evaluated in terms of consultants who have proposed, international consultants who have proposed, to look at all the technologies as part of a road making exercise. So what comes out of that we'll know at some point in time. But there is stuff going on. How profitable are the wind companies that are already operating? I have no idea. Okay, Rebecca has someone right at and the back. And there'll be lots of those questions, by the way, that I don't know. Okay, Rebecca has someone right at the back with the mic there now. Yep, hello, Wade Dick Whitaker. Um, I want to address something slightly different, and that is the question of greenhouse gas. You referred to it off and on through your speech, but you didn't make a point of it, really. Right now, there's fairly good evidence the oceans are 
at least some sections of it are dying in front of us, largely due to global warming and dissolved carbon dioxide. And the conversion rate from oil to carbon dioxide, one ton makes three. And of course, a lot more for oil sands oil. I'm wondering, first of all, have you got an estimate of the amount of carbon dioxide that would be reduced or in some form that's understandable by putting muskrat falls online? And second question is, can we in fact get some money from that through greenhouse gas points? Because people are putting money into things like trees and this, that, and the other, as you know, when they buy their air ticket and all the rest of it, and maybe that would reduce the cost of the project altogether. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Again, I don't know. You know, I mean, these are questions that are not for an economist to answer. I mean, these are, I mean, are there greenhouse gases associated with thermal generation? Without a doubt. Can we estimate those? Without a doubt. Do we know what the price of carbon will be? No, we don't. But we can you look around estimates that have been used, like in BC or elsewhere, and we can get an estimate of what those things might cost you. Uh, with respect to, to credits for carbon and those kinds of things, you know, I'm not the person to ask those questions. There are people around that can do that. I'm not the one. I'm sorry. Okay. Mike has a question emailed in, Johan. And then we're going to go to the right-hand side so Rebecca can find someone. The gentleman with the white sweater was quick to get up there. Rebecca? Okay, Mike. Uh, here's a question that wasn't addressed in your presentation, uh, Wade, but you might have some thoughts on it. If the potential of Gull Island is said to be two and a half times that of Muskrat Falls, why are we developing the smaller project? Is it that we need an alternative route for our power before we potentially enter into negotiations with Quebec for the Gull Island project? Well, right now, I mean, we don't need the amount of energy that Gull would produce, right? I mean, uh, Muskrat is 824 megawatts. Gull is 2,200, 2200 megawatts. Uh, you know, it is true that if you were to sell the 2,200 megawatts of power, the cost would be lower. If you can't sell it and the capital costs are higher, then the per-unit cost will be higher. So, so right now, the cost of generating Gull and, and transmitting it to the U.S. and selling it for what the, the price of electricity in the States is now might not be as attractive as people think it is. So it, it, whether, I mean, my presentation wasn't on Gull, it was on do we have a need for 824 megawatts of power? Uh, over a period of time, we do. Do we have a need for 2,200 megawatts of power? I don't think we do. Can we export it? We might or might not. Shale has changed the market around completely because you can now generate electricity using gas at a relatively low price next to the markets in the U.S. that need it. And it can be scaled at the level you want to have it at. So Gull might be more of a challenge for us than we thought initially. The technology has changed. And uh, my, only, my presentation wasn't on Muskrat, or Gull was on Muskrat, and that was the only thing I was thinking about. Um, Gull is a different issue. If you're thinking about Gull as meeting the domestic demand, it'll be more expensive than Muskrat meeting the domestic demand, because while the capital cost per unit is lower, the number of units that we can use will be lower as well. Mike, do you have another emailed one? Okay. Johan, to Mike. Thanks. How can Nalcor or anybody else justify charging me more as a shareholder taxpayer than rates to be paid by people in Nova Scotia? My only response to that, Mike, would be, uh, and to the, the person who asked, was that do we need the power? If the answer is yes, what's the least costly way of doing it? If in doing that, somebody gets access to something and sells it for a lower price than we pay. Well, it doesn't really matter. That, I mean, politically it might be an issue. Economically it's not an issue. I mean, you know, are there alternative ways of meeting our needs? If there are, then we need to discuss those. If, the, if you don't want to meet your own needs because somebody might have a benefit from it that you can't capture, to me, it's not a productive discussion. It is one that the politicians will engage in, whether or not we, sh we should be paying prices, and I don't know what the price in Nova Scotia will be, but we should try paying prices that are lower than what they are in Nova Scotia. Well, I don't know what the price in Nova Scotia will be. We put a slide up on what the prices are likely to be here, 
and you're not going to see a huge jump in the price of electricity, or at least not expect at this point in time. That could go, that could go wrong. But if we need it, we should ask yourself what the least costly way of doing it, notwithstanding the point that the gentleman made over here that you could raise the price enough, and as Dr. Fian suggests, you could raise the price enough that is no longer a problem. That's a true statement. And yes, you can design systems whereby you might be able to transfer stuff to people to, to minimize the adverse effect. You won't eliminate it, but you can minimize it. There still will be an adverse effect on people who are very vulnerable. That's a public policy discussion we might want to have. It is not one that we're going to be able to do right now to take care of the problem we have right now. Right? The fact that the price in Nova Scotia might be higher or lower than us, we shouldn't worry about that particular issue. If I develop something and somebody uses that idea, and it's not copyrighted, to, to make more profits on it, so the person who developed the internet probably didn't get a lot from it, despite Al Gore. But, um, you know, if it's useful for us to develop, that's a good thing. If it's cheapest for us to develop and meets a need, that's a good thing. Whatever else happens, I'm not overly concerned about it. Me, personally, I'm not. So, that, you know, it's possible, but I don't know what it is going to be. Okay. Well, Wade to be succinct in his answers also. I'm stuck. <laughs> uh, gentleman with the white sweater with the mic at the back, and then Johan, the gentleman with the black blazer with his hand up there. There's a guy right behind me, so I'm going to give it to him. It's easy. <laughs> Phil Hallowig is my name. I've been in the, working as a hydro engineer for more than four, four decades uh, in Newfoundland and internationally. First of all, a, a point of clarification. A uh, gentleman over there stated uh, there's been no research on wind energy in Newfoundland. Uh, last summer I attended a presentation of a graduate student uh, examining that subject, and I understand his research was sponsored by uh, Nalcor. So I just want to put that on the record. My question is, regards the cost uh, assumptions on uh, shale gas. Do, they, do these assumptions and forecasts uh, include for use of gas as a transportation fuel? No. No. Yeah. I mention that because I uh, was very impressed with, the, uh, initially in, in Delhi, the whole city runs its transportation, public transportation, taxis, uh, motorcycle rickshaws, and many private cars are run off na compressed natural gas. Uh, I visited Bangladesh. The extent of use for compressed national gas, natural gas, for transportation appears to be enormous. Well, well, the, and if the price of natural gas stays low... It just seems to me that with high price of oil, uh, it's just a matter of time before natural gas starts to be used as a transportation fuel, and I su suggest that your, if it, these, this effect isn't, okay, include, you're over now. isn't included in your forecast, it's going to be important in the future. Natural gas is going to be the fuel of the future. It's going to go up in price, and there's no reason why natural gas can't be converted into diesel or into, you can convert cars over. It takes a long time for that to happen, and you need a certain infrastructure in place, but yeah, that can happen. And especially if the, if the divergence between the price of oil and price of natural gas continues on or stays at this level for a significant period of time, then it would make sense to take natural gas and turn it into diesel or, or take natural gas and uh, uh, put the infrastructure in place so you can have a natural gas service station, for example. That's what you need. And then, you know, at, when new cars get built, if the advantage of natural gas is so high, then what will happen is that people, when they design the cars, because it gets easier that way if you do it from the design purpose, uh, yeah, that's a possibility. So all you're saying is that what? That there might be an alternative source of demand for natural gas, which will do what? Which will cause the price to go up, without a doubt. The implication for electricity in, the U in the Europe, in terms of LNG and natural gas, is going up. We would expect that over a period of time, the price of natural gas will go up. Go up to such a point, at some point in time, it will be profitable to develop natural gas offshore. Right now, it's not. And there's no plans to do that right now. Okay. Gentleman in the middle here. Then we're going to go back to Mike 
Uh, and then we're going to go to the aisle I hadn't counted on. So Rebecca, a lady at the top in the white sweater in the aisle after Mike. Uh, gentleman with the mic. <laughs> Too many mics. The, okay. Yeah, you're coming. You're Can coming. you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Dennis Brown. The, uh, first, a comment. My comment is this. Uh, conservation seems to be overlooked in the presentation because uh, we've been consistently told by experts that if uh, baseboard radiation was outlawed in this province and convection and convect air was mandated for new construction, the requirements would go down for electricity by some 30%. That's my comment. My question is this. The 14.3 cents you're using for the cost of a, of a kilowatt is the wholesale rate to Newfoundland Power. Once Newfoundland Power gets that, they're going to put on another two to three cents, and then there's a municipal tax that goes on it as well. So the 16 to 17 cents that uh, Professor Fien was referencing, well, he was only referencing 20%. Just do the figure on that. The real cost for people at the bills, are, uh, 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 the bills are going to be between 16.5 and 17 cents, and that's only if all goes well, because every cost overrun is to be borne by the ratepayers. Thank you. Thank you. If you're saying, Dennis, that uh, if, if, if uh, costs go up, prices will go up, without a doubt, that's a true statement. Uh, but, but, you know, what's the alternative? If the alternative is do small-scale hydro and so okay, uh, they're as, as subject to cost runs as the big project, without a doubt. If you're telling me that we can have energy conservation to the point that we don't need to put these things in place, well, fine. Uh, I don't know that to be the case. Uh, I know they had a, Mar a Marbeck study that looked at the possibility of doing these kinds of things, but it, it didn't seem to be able to save enough in order to avoid the need to build capacity. Um, you know, it, the price that you will pay will be a weighted average of the current prices and the new marginal, the new prices that will come on as a result of muskrat or whatever it is. So if you have a price of 20 cents and a price of 10 cents, depending on how much energy comes from one source or the other, the price will be somewhere in the middle, right? So if, if, if you have 60% of your energy from traditional sources and 40% from a new source, that'll be like a 14 cent price, just to understand. So when people talk about 16 cents, that's not the price people would pay, right? You saw the, the slide there uh, that the government put out in terms of the, the price to, the impact on your, on your fuel bill. And so what you're getting, Dennis, I think, is you're getting some flexibility in terms of what happens to the control of prices in the future in exchange for a higher capital cost now. I think that's what we're saying, or that's what, I think that's what I think that's the fact. Now, will, will cost or runs translate into higher prices? Yes. Okay, we'll have one at a time now. Thanks. Yeah, okay. You know, those costs will be had to recover in some form or another, without a doubt. Yes. I so, think you're violently agreeing. But, 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 <laughs> Dennis, you need to, you need to utter, recognize that the, the difference between thermal and hydro will translate into higher prices if the cost of fuel go up. Would you accept that? No, I mean, just, just a simple point, yes or no? Okay, Wade, that's your last question. <laughs> your, your last response, very quickly. So the idea that it's going to escalate every year is incorrect. 
that oil, the price of oil will escalate every year? No, that the amount on people's bills will escalate because if it goes up to $110 a barrel, it might, but if it goes down to 90 which a lot of uh, Indian economists are telling us today, our bill will go down to 9.5 cents again. Sure. Which is some of the lowest in the country. So, what you're, what, so what you're saying, Dennis, I mean, what you're saying for the people here is that what? That there is the chance that the price of oil might not rise, or, or might not rise as much as they're thinking, or might go down, without a, without a doubt. And so the risk that you're asking is what? You've got to believe that the price of oil won't escalate to the, to the amount that they're talking about, because if it does, then you've got, you have no control over that. If you have the capital in place and the, and the hydro, you have some control over the escalation. And that's what those diagrams showed you. Okay. I have emailed in questions. We're going over here next, so you can put your hands down. Um, I agree with Dr. Locke that shale gas will keep power prices down for many years to come. How then do we compete in attracting industry and attracting new citizens if our power rates are so much higher because of Mus Muskrat Falls? Won't we be priced out of the market? Well, the, the, the diagrams that we showed you there show you that the prices won't be higher as a result of Muscat Falls. They'll be lower. That's a simple answer. And any more emailed in? Uh, another one on cost overruns. I have the lady yeah. behind you next, sir. From, uh, from John Hearn. It says, uh, the cost overrun we have for Muskrat Falls is 15%, which is unrealistic. How would a 50 to 60% overrun affect this best option? Well, it would, would cause the price to be higher. It would reduce the attractiveness of Muskrat. But that assumes what? That there's no cost overrun on a thermal generation option and that the price of oil doesn't increase above what they thought. I mean, you can play this game all you want. The, the issue, there's no reason to believe that a number of small projects will have a lower cost overrun than, than a large project. It is the case that we're going into a situation now where we're going to have demand for labor severely constraining relative to the supply of labor. And you are going to see costs overrun. You're going to see increase in, in, in the cost of doing business for everybody. That's the nature of what's going to happen here. So are we likely to have 15% contingency? I don't know. I, if you want to tell me it's going to be 25 or 30 or whatever it is, yeah, that's, that's possible. But that's true for both options. That's what you need to think about. And so the fact you may have cost overruns and it may be more expensive and your price of your bill may go up, that's a true statement. But if you still need the power, you're still going to have to deal with it. It just means that you're going to pay a higher electricity price, like some jurisdictions do. It's a matter of do we need it? And once we need it, what is the least cost way of doing it? Now, if you want to argue that the cost overruns or the increase in fuel costs or increase in something is more likely with muskrat than with the thermal option, then we can have that discussion. But you're going to have to believe that that's the way it's going to go in order to come down to that particular conclusion. And there's no firm evidence that that's the case, or at least I'm not aware of any. Okay, we've got the lady at the top. Hi, uh, my name is Joy Hecht. I'm an environmental economist. Um, it seems to me most of the comments we've heard so far are essentially suggesting that the scope of this analysis was too narrow and left out things people would like to see addressed, to which your answer really appropriately is, that's not what I was doing. Um, and mine is something of the same. The thing that I see left out is any economic analysis of the non-marketed environmental impacts. You allude to eventual carbon emissions charges, but you haven't talked about the economic costs involved in any other environmental consequences of these things, which is also beyond the scope of your study. Um, and one of the ones I'm thinking of in particular, all this talk of shale gas, is the disastrous effect it's having on water supply in Ohio, in New York, in the upper Midwest, and the earthquakes resulting from it in Ohio. But my question is really this. Would the Applied Economics Research Initiative be interested in working with some of the people who have raised these concerns to broaden your analysis so that we could start to get an analysis of the NALCOR proposals that takes into account things that are beyond what they put on the table already and could start addressing where does wind really fit in? Where does offshore gas fit in? 
what are the environmental costs if we quantified it, the non-market ones, and so on. Let me, uh, let me respond. Two things. Um, <laughs> with respect to the Applied Economic uh, Research Initiative, we have an environmental economist, uh, and I'm sure that he would be interested, the a Russian economist that we have with the department, and I'm sure that he would be interested in talking to anybody who's, uh, you know, ha has a particular applied economic research problem that they're interested in. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide the expertise in the department to help people address issues that they find important and hopefully that the researcher finds important as well. With respect to shale gas and the environmental impacts of shale gas, if the environmental, it's for example in terms of water and all those kinds of things, uh, if, if they turn out to be prohibitive, what that will mean is that the price of natural gas will go up, right? In other words, if, if the environmental costs are such that the people are prohibited from continuous drilling and the implication for water and all those kind of things, then what will happen is that the amount of shale gas that's available for market will go down and the price of natural gas will go up. That's the consequence, that's the consequence of that. So, sorry. If the decisions on whether to allow fracking take that into account, and it's not clear that they will because those are political decisions, they're not necessarily based on environmental impacts. Well, uh, right now Canada, right now Canada is going through a uh, pretty serious analysis of the implications of uh, shale gas. Uh, I, I don't know when that study will come out, but it's currently being done by the federal government, and, and, and environmental implications of that will be taken into account. Whether or not the politics are such that uh, no matter what the findings are in terms of environmental stuff, that they won't take into account, I don't know, but they are looking at it. And you know, I would encourage you to speak to. Uh, Dr. Lysenko, who is an environmental economist with our department, uh, if you have issues you think are important that you want to see addressed as part of this particular initiative, we're happy to receive ideas and we're happy to try to do things that are useful and interesting for people. I'm usually reluctant to go over time, but we have uh, several people with hands up, so I think we'll go questions till 22. Can people live with that? So I've got gentleman with the mic now, then Dr. Fian did have his hand up. Then I'm going to go back one, 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 one. Okay. Uh. Thank you, uh, Danny Dumares. Uh, Dr. Fian, uh, as I uh, heard you say right from the very beginning, while you did biology, you're not an expert on Honda biology. Of I don't anything. remember any about it. No, that's right. <laughs> Similar to me and uh, other things. But uh, I note that there is a doctor from the University of Toronto who was an expert on cost overruns. And uh, this gentleman certainly made it quite clear that a project of this nature could quite easily double or even triple uh, when it comes to doing a six or seven year project of this nature. And of course, as you say, the assumptions that you have used is that this project is based on $4.4 billion at 5% interest a year. Uh, when we look at the situation now, where we had a public tender in the province of Quebec uh, to bring in 300 megawatts of power by wind that came in at 11.2 cents per kilowatt. When we look at the fact that PEI right now is going to be taking on wind power that will give them 30% of their provincial usage from wind power. We have two successful wind power projects in this project and I noticed in this province and I noticed that Dr. Fian was quite explicit, equally as explicit, that a solution to our problem would be to earn us more wind. We are presently only using 4% of our power in wind. He, he was explicit that we could use uh, the wind power and do it through a private-public partnership so that uh, the same thing has been done in the future as it was done with this wind power, that the private sector would grow up there, do the public tender, and it wouldn't be anything to do with the taxpayers. Would you uh, think it's prudent then to look at this option rather than roll the dice on a possibility that cost overruns that are projected by the experts could very well triple the cost of financing and certainly as we're looking at the financing for next fiscal year would jeopardize us financially as you said quite clearly last June. That's your two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure. The question is why? That there can be cost overruns or that we should be pursuing wind? I'm saying, are you prepared to roll the dice 
and take the chance on Muskrat Falls rather than do a private-public partnership to get the power that we need until we can bring the power back from the upper Churchill. Is that the position that we're supposed to think about? Roll the dice and take the chance that this project could go way out of whack rather than go out and let the private sector join with us, no fiscal risk to the taxpayer or the ratepayer of this province. We can get power at 11.2 cents. Well, Mr. Dumaras, let me respond to you the following way. Um, by coming here tonight and doing my presentation, I obviously believe what I said to you, that the Muskrat Falls mm -hmm. option is the best option. That doesn't mean that there might not be new information come forward, like you're suggesting, uh, that there's a credible alternative uh, that might beat it out. And if you have such a credible alternative that you have the, the uh, research to back it up and that we can not roll the dice on wind uh, or roll the dice on hydro or roll the dice on thermal, there's a risk no matter what we do, right? And so, is there a need for power? If the answer is yes, can we reduce the need by conservation? The answer is probably yes, to some degree. Can we reduce the, the, the need for power by increasing the price? The answer is yes. There are consequences to all these things, just so we understand. You know, whether or not, can I say that costs won't be overrun? I cannot say that. Whether 15% contingency is enough, I don't know. But we have to be able to meet the need in one form or another, either by conservation, higher prices, or some alternative. If we have a, an alternative that's cheaper, and I mean, don't mean financial, I mean cheaper in all the senses, resource cost, environmental impacts, and all those kind of things, then let's, let's talk about that and let's, 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 let's review it and consider it. Right now, the information that I've looked at and what is available to me and I've tried to look at whatever I could, leads me to make the conclusion that this is the best option right now in the time frame that we have to make decisions. Other things will come about over a longer period of time, but I don't think right now that I think this is the option, and this is the one that I am saying that this, in my opinion, on the balance of probabilities, is the best one for us. Okay. You don't have to agree with that. I understand that. Now, I'm sure you don't. Right? Uh, but I have tried to explain to you on what basis I made that decision. I saw it work when I was on the board yep. of directors. I saw it work. It's working now. Yep. With not a cent to the taxpayer or the ratepayer in incremental cash. We can do it again. We don't need to roll the dice okay. with billions of dollars of taxpayers' money at this point in our history. Okay, we want to squeeze in the last few questions. Uh, Jim Fian did have his hand up. My power has been usurped, as always. So the gentleman with the mic, you go ahead, and then we'll go to Jim. <laughs> go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thanks. Uh, one thing which uh, um, I'd like to comment about uh, and then ask a question is, um, to me, there is too little context in the presentation. Uh, the, the picture is too narrow. It, it has been mentioned before in the discussion, but for me, the most important thing is the comparison which is missing, in my opinion, between the prices of electricity in jurisdictions such like New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, assuming that uh, the project goes on and over the lifetime of the project especially that we are providing a link between Nova Scotia and the province. Because if the prices over there, over that period of time, are significantly lower, and we are only compensating essentially for the production from Holyrood, so only a small percentage of our power requirement, then the logic dictates to import the electricity from there through the link until we come close enough for us to develop the project and then sell to them, because there will be the break-even point achieved at some point, as you are suggesting. So, and this is a tremendous burden on the economy of the island for the next 10, 20, and I heard, heard a minister stating even 40 years 
to wait until that break-even point comes. This is the price the economy of the island will pay. For sure, there is no escape from that. And th this is all missing from your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Fian. Uh, Wade, did you want to respond? No, Jim. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a few points here. A first uh, simple observation, and that is um, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, uh, it was shown that the price was $75 uh, over the long haul for uh, Muskrat Falls. For generation. For generation. And I think it would have been more complete to put in the full number, which includes uh, a pretty si sizable amount that would be borne by all the uh, ratepayers for the additional transmission, which costs almost as much as the generation itself. It's uh, not as much, but it's a pretty substantial portion. And that's where we get this number, I think, of $143 a megawatt hour talked about quite a bit. So that's, that's really the cost delivered. And, you know, to plant it at Goose Bay without delivery to the island and to the consumers really doesn't mean anything. It's got to be delivered, so you may as well include up front the um, transmission costs. Um, the other thing I'd point out is, you know, I don't want to debate my paper much, but I do want to point out that the, the substance of my paper was that if you move to pricing that is uh, based upon peak demands, based upon seasonal rates, um, time of day use, you can have the capacity to reduce consumption quite a bit. And I don't think it was very fair at all to throw out that 80% number, which I didn't mention, no. didn't have in my paper, no. and would not support, because the price should never be higher than the marginal cost burning fuel at Holyrood. That's the absolute maximum. And the objective is not to make people consume less and, and you know, do the joke you made. The idea is to use strategic pricing in order to slow down the rate of increase in consumption. Not, you know, go home and sit in the cold by a candle, which is a sort of spin that's been put on it. It's about trying to price so that people will conserve. And, of course, the paper also pointed out, if that drives up now, of course, profit, as the gentleman pointed out at the beginning, you can use the extra profit to redistribute income. You can even make income more equitably distributed, potentially. That's a policy decision. Um, but what I wanted to get at was the issue of supply. Um, and be quick, Jim. Well, I'll take my time. <laughs> I'll, I'll take my mic. <laughs> well, we'll see. But since, since I got okay, a little going. bit of a spin put on me, I think I'll take a, a few more seconds. But I just want to... Um, <laughs> I want to get, I want to, get to, the, to, to, the, to the issue at hand, and that is you can't really assume all the consumption increase is going to be met by Holyrood. In the past two quarters of this year, second quarter, third quarter, 700,000 megawatts worth of electricity was spilled over the dams. Last year, Holyrood operated at 40% of what it was producing at in 2004. And it's produced higher in the past than that. So there's, there is hydro on the island. Because after all, Grand Falls has only closed down since 2009. Their assets, plus what they used to consume, are now available. We also have in the isolated option plan a, um, three hydro sites that are small and some wind, which is limited. But that's enough. And the thrust of the paper was that's enough to get us to 2020, 2025, assuming consumption doesn't grow dramatically. And that gives us those extra years to investigate the possibility of getting Gull Island going, because then we can bring power back to the island as well as export if we can, our court case with Quebec is successful and we can get access to their grid. It also opens up the possibility of importing uh, oil, be, uh, sorry, importing electricity, because if shale gas is driving New England prices down to 25, 30, 40 dollars a megawatt hour in the wholesale market right now. It's costly to get it here, admittedly. It might be 100 dollars to get it here. I don't know. But again, that's an option. And my point in the paper was to say we have enough supply now to get us to the 2020s. 
And therefore, we don't have to rush into this. Now, we may be well right. I mean, we might find that oil prices actually are even higher than we expect in a couple of years' time, in which case we can still do muskrat. It's still there. It's not going anywhere. But we don't really have to rush into it. Okay? Okay. Thank you. So we're really out of time. Apologies to those of you who had your hand up a long time. Uh, Jim, we'd love to have you up here to do a separate session so we can talk about that. Wade, this can... <laughs> Mark your calendars. Uh, Wade, closing remarks, and uh, then I'll just clue up with a couple of thank yous. My only closing remark is that uh, just take into account what was discussed here tonight and, and, and make your own assessment of whether or not it's credible or not credible. Uh, uh, there are alternatives, as Jim talked about. We could import through the, the, the lines right now. There are risks associated with that, and those need to be considered. Uh, it is the case, as I said, that you can raise prices enough, whatever enough it happens to be, to have the impact you suggested. It is true that you didn't put in 80% in the thing, you, but you let people believe that 20% would be enough. Um, you know, whether it's enough or not is, is the debatable point. Um, it is a policy issue how we go about doing this stuff, and that's what we want to have a discussion for. And so that's all I'm here and trying to do tonight. I can appreciate that, uh, you know, you might not have liked or even, or even thought they were correct some of the comments. They're put forward. You have the option of refuting them. I'm sure you will. You're a good economist, and uh, I have a lot of respect for you. Um, that being said, I don't think that's the option we want to pursue. But, you know, I'm open to be subject to being proven wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. You were handed evaluations as you came in with your programs, and if you're viewing on the web, uh, you can click on the screen and fill it in. It's really important to get that feedback. Thanks to the crew at DELTS and Marketing Communications, Harris Center, Rogers. Thanks to the audience for coming out. I know there's a pent-up demand for more of this. We hope to meet it. And uh, for those of you in the uh, Bruno's Center, we'll have a reception downstairs. Maybe you can corner Wade some more or each other. Thanks a million for your time. Good night. Mm -hmm.